Shalom and welcome to the special seminar of the Research Center for Innovation in Learning Technologies at the Open University of Israel. We are honored to have here with us today Professor Emeritus Tom Reeves from the College of Education at the University of Georgia. As our special guest, Professor Reeves will deliver uh, the opening keynote of the ninth Chase Conference for the Study of Innovation and Learning Technologies that will be held tomorrow, February 11, uh, 2014, and the following uh, uh, day at the Open University of Israel campus in Ranana. The Chase Conference is the major annual event of Israeli researchers of innovation and learning technologies, and it draws about 600 participants both academics and practitioners. We would like to thank Professor Reeves for being with us today at this pre-conference event and for giving us the opportunity to conduct this special seminar. Professor Reeves is Professor Emeritus of Learning, Design and Technology at the Department of Educational Psychology and Instructional Technology, College of Education, the University of Georgia. Professor Reeves was a Fulbright lecturer in Peru, and he has been an invited speaker in the United States and additional 30 other countries. During the years 97-2000, he was the editor of the Journal of Interactive Learning Research. Professor Reeves has, fellowship, has been awarded numerous honors including in 2003 the Fellowship Award from the Association for the Advancement of Computing in Education, and in 2010 he was made a Fellow of the Australian Society for Computers in Learning in Theatre Education. I am delighted to invite Professor Reeves to deliver the, uh, the seminar titled Socially Responsible Educational Technology Research, The Promise of Educational Design Research. Tom, the floor is yours. This is my first time in Israel and has been uh, the, a lifetime dream to be here and I could not have realized it in a better way than to spend the last five days as the guest of Yoram and Noga Estet, and their home in Jerusalem and uh, the he uh, should have many careers. I know he's an archaeologist and a geologist and an expert in learning technologies, but he could also be a hotel proprietor <laughs> and a tour guide and um, probably many, many other things that I haven't thought of yet. But uh, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to keep this really open and informal. And uh, as we go along, if you have questions or you just want to take issue with what I'm saying, please. Uh, uh, I, I know that uh, uh, Israelis have a reputation for never, you know, just sitting back and never saying anything. But, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, so please, let's keep it interactive. Let's keep it open. Let's keep it uh, in discussions. So uh, this is the campus of the University of Georgia. I just got an email from my wife uh, a few minutes ago that said they're expecting another snowstorm which is very unusual. Uh, we had one a couple weeks ago. It literally closed the whole city of Atlanta. The city of Atlanta was in gridlock. People spent 40 hours in their cars stuck on the road. And children got stuck in schools and on school buses overnight. It was a complete disaster. And how much snow do you think it was? Three feet? Two feet? Two inches. Two inches, <laughs> two inches of snow. <laughs> uh, shut the city down. So anyway, they're expecting another storm uh, later this week. So hopefully it won't be as bad and so forth. Our university is the uh, <clears throat> oldest university in, uh, oldest public university in the United States. Now there are older institutions like uh, Harvard and, <clears throat> and Yale and so forth, but those are private institutions. The university of Georgia was founded in 1785. And uh, the, uh, there's an interesting, at the entrance to our university, there's a historical plaque that talks about the founding of the university and so forth. But in the middle of the paragraph, it says, the University of Georgia was closed from 1861 to 1865 
for the war for Southern independence. That's what they call it. <laughs> so, uh, what, of course, most people would say the Civil War. Uh, but uh, it's a beautiful campus, and I hope that uh, all of you will come and visit when you can, and we'd love to have you there. Now, our campus, we have 35,000 students, uh, mostly residential students, uh, and we have uh, about 7,500 faculty and staff. And right in the middle of our campus is a football stadium, and it holds 94,000 people. <laughs> And every time we have a football game, you can't get a seat. You have to know someone or have bought your tickets uh, many years in advance and so forth. They even have these uh, luxurious sky boxes up here. I, I've been at the University of Georgia for 32 years, and I've never been in the sky box. You have to know somebody. But uh, I, my seat is right about here, and I go to most games. Uh, and I love to have international visitors go to a game because it is quite an event. Uh, uh, so now, you're probably familiar with, uh, it's, we call it football. It's not what real football is, but maybe you call it gridiron or something like that. And the University of Georgia hasn't won a national championship since 1980. We're, we're one of those, we always finish in the top 10, but never quite make it to the, the top. <clears throat> and of course, we have a mascot. Did you know that all colleges and universities in the United States have mascots? Uh, ours is a bulldog. Did any of you go to an American university? Where did you go? Brandeis University. Did you have a mascot? No, no really? Oh, what about you? I went to Northwestern, we did. Yeah. The wildcat. The wildcat, yeah. Usually the mascot is an animal. It can be a plant, like the Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, it can be something mysterious, like <clears throat> the Georgetown Hoyas. Nobody knows what it is. But uh, we make millions of dollars every year selling paraphernalia with bulldogs on it, T-shirts, cups, pens, everything you can imagine. It's a really big moneymaker. So if it works in the States, why not here? So I think, I think you need a mascot. Open University of Israel. Ibexes, uh, or something else. But I'll help you come up with a scheme for that. But uh, you can solve all your financial problems with uh, selling. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, actually, I've, I've taken this universe, uh, idea to Australia and uh, into uh, New Zealand. A couple of universities have uh, adopted mascots, and they're selling you know little animals and so forth. Anyway. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about educational design research. How many of you have heard before of design-based research or educational design research? So you've heard the term. How many of you are doing it? Uh, sort of, yeah, okay. Well, uh, you know, it's a, an up and coming idea. It's been around for about 20 years now uh, and uh, I'm going to try to introduce it to you in such a way that maybe you think, hey, you know, that's something I could try or I could work with some of my students on and so forth. Uh, really, the, the, uh, a, a long time, people began to become concerned about the lack of impact of educational research. Of course, people had their careers built around educational research. They published lots of articles. They presented papers at conferences. But there was relatively little impact on practice, on teaching and learning in the public schools, in the colleges and universities, and so forth. To illustrate that, let me, this is my college of education. It's one of three buildings that we have. I'm in the uh, third floor of this building. And uh, as at the University of Georgia, as with most colleges and universities, most of the research is done by faculty in the, uh, in education is done by faculty in schools and colleges of education and their graduate students. Now, my uh, college of education, we have 220 faculty members and split into nine departments. And we have about 5,000 of the students in our 35,000 student university. So it's a big operation. And uh, I want to compare Georgia which is down here, 
with the state of Wisconsin in terms of impact of educational research. Uh, there are two states that are roughly the same size. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, insights.com did an analysis of the colleges of education that published the most articles in referee journals over a five-year period. So during that five-year period, the faculty in the College of Education at the University of Wisconsin wrote 202 articles in the top education journals. Georgia was second, 2001. We'd only written a couple more articles. We could have been number one. You know, Then Michigan, Indiana, Maryland. Um, so you would think, wow, all that research going on in Georgia. The Georgia education system must be one of the best in the country. Well, that's not the case. Here's a comparison of Georgia versus Wisconsin. We spend about the same amount of money per pupil per year. The teacher salaries are about the same, a little higher in Georgia. But look at the high school graduation rates. Now, the overall national high school graduation rate is 70%. So in Wisconsin, it's 78%. In Georgia, it's 52% of students graduate from high school. That's shameful. Uh, in terms of uh, overall rankings in education, Wisconsin is seventh. Georgia's 48th. We say, thank God for Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, all that research being generated at the and University of Georgia. Socio-demographic yeah. background for the two states? Yeah, that would be um, certainly another explanation. Could be the differences in the socioeconomic status of the uh, groups. Uh, there certainly are a higher percentage of students on free and free lunch and so forth, which is one of the indicators of poverty. Uh, and there's a much, uh, not a much, but a, a certainly a uh, higher population of minorities in Georgia than in Wisconsin, but uh, not enough to explain these dramatic differences. And certainly, you know, I mean, I've been at Georgia for 32 years. When I came there, they were 49th. So, you know, 30 years, go up one spot, not so good. So where's the impact? Where's the impact of all this educational research? Now let's talk about educational technology. How many of you would consider yourself to be in the field of educational technology or learning technologies or something like that? Most, a lot of folks in here. Well, our, our research is kind of right up there with uh, the Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. Um, <laughs> you know, we constantly uh, hit, get hit with head, headlines like this. The iPad mini could spur an education revolution. Now, I'm old enough to remember you know, when overhead transparencies were going to spur an educational revolution. And then program instruction, instructional television, and uh, computer-based training, and interactive video discs, and interactive CD-ROMs, and the World Wide Web, and so forth. It's all going to be an education revolution. We haven't had an education revolution. Uh, and we won't with an iPad mini uh, or any other technology per se, because technology in itself has zero impact on learning, zero. It's all about educational methods, pedagogy, that has an impact on learning. And we go around and we tell lies to people. You probably have seen this thing, uh, the so-called pyramid of learning, saying that you know if you read, you only get 10%, you only retain 10%. If you look at pictures, you get 30%. Watch a movie, you get 50%. If you participate in some way, you get more and higher. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Well, this is a lie. It's completely bogus. Uh, Professor Michael Melinda from Indiana University said, decided, where did this thing come from? And he found out that some petroleum engineers that worked in Houston, Texas, made it up in the 1960s. Just made it up. And they should have been suspicious, because look at these nice, even percentages. You never get that in social science, in education. So we, you know, we tell these lies. Now, maybe there's a trend there, but certainly not the kind of dramatic results that you see 
presented in the graph. Uh, <clears throat> so unfortunately, I think we, although we use our research to build our careers and so forth, we just don't have enough impact on teaching and learning. And this has been demonstrated by numerous uh, authors. Uh, one of my favorites is Larry Cuban from Stanford University. He's written uh, a half dozen books about technology and education. And they all basically say the same thing, oversold and underused computers in the classroom. What he did for this particular book, he and his graduate students went out into the Silicon Valley area of California, arguably one place where you'd expect technology to be used and have an impact. And they found that despite ubiquitous technology, all, everything you could want and desire, uh, that they found very little evidence of tradition altering classroom instruction. Most tech uh, instructors and teachers didn't use the technology at all, and the ones who did used it mainly to maintain existing practice. So the reality of educational technology research, and, and by the way, I don't think this is limited to educational technology research. I think it could be applied to most educational research and indeed most social science. Isolated researchers conduct individual studies that are linked to their own little esoteric research agenda, but have little concern or relationship with practice. So it's not very socially responsible. These studies are presented at conferences, attended largely by other researchers, not by practitioners, and published in journals that, frankly, no one reads. And occasional literature reviews and meta-analyses are published. When, uh, you know, I used to be the editor of one of these journals. <clears throat> Probably many of you in this room have published in some of these journals. We churn it out, you know, quarter after quarter, uh, all this research, and yet it's like it's accurate you know, going in a vacuum. It's not really having much impact in the world. A great book I really recommend to you. Have any, read, any of you read Visible Learning by John Hattie? Uh, I see one head saying yes. Uh, Professor Hattie used to be the dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Auckland, and now he has an endowed chair at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. And I met, I met him down there a couple years ago. Uh, and he wrote, he's written many books. So this one's called a Vis Visible Learning, a synthesis of over 800 meta-analyses related to achievement in education. And what he looked at was 135 different variables that influence learning and tried to tease out which ones are most impactful, have the most effect using meta-analyses, and they looked at 50,000 studies, millions and millions of students involved. These are just 10 of the factors. Formative evaluation to teachers on their progress, reciprocal teaching as a pedagogical strategy, feedback to students, mastery learning, requiring students to learn at a very high level before they can move on, cooperative learning, computer-assisted instruction, simulations, web-based learning, distance education, and television. Now, Hattie, in his book, argues that if you don't have an effect size of 0.4 or more, it really doesn't, you shouldn't bother. Well, here's some of the data. You can see that all of the things that we in the learning technologies value are below that 0.4 threshold. Computer-assisted instruction, Simulations, web-based learning, distance education. Television is harmful, it turns out. <laughs> the more TV you watch, the less you learn. Um, and the things that really matter are the instructional methods. Giving teachers feedback on their progress. Uh, feedback to students. Uh, cooperative learning, mastery learning. These are the basic building blocks of effective educational programs. There are others as well. Would yeah. it be possible maybe just because these technologies are too new to be assimilated by the education system for Would that be a possibility? It, it could be a possibility. I think part of the problem, though, is that most of these instances, when, when we do studies comparing classroom instruction with, say, computer based instruction, the overall finding is no significant difference mm -hmm. because they're not controlling for other variables. 
Uh, they're not really understanding the nature. What are the real critical differences in pedagogical design between, say, a computer-based lesson and a classroom lesson? Uh, what are the motivations of the students? It, it's much more complex than traditional experimental methods can tease out. Uh, I think that's a more likely explanation. And other people have demonstrated this. This is a book called The No Significant Difference Phenomena. Tom Russell, who used to be at North Carolina State University, uh, he looked at studies from 1928 to 2008, looking at all the various technologies, starting with films that Thomas Edison and others promoted. Thomas Edison predicted in, I think it was 1919, that films would replace textbooks within 10 years. That didn't happen. Um, and so he looked at many different distance delivery modes and basically found, and it just makes common sense, when the course materials and teaching methodology are held constant, there's no significant difference in learning outcomes. And why would there be? And yet, for some reason, people expect it to be. Uh, people take uh, lessons that are taught in a class, record them on video, slap them on the web, and think there's going to be an improvement in outcomes. Why would they be? There's still, it's just a lecture. Unless you've really built in some meaningful interactions, some reason that would motivate the students to really watch it and engage with it and use it, maybe reinterpret it, learning's not going to occur. Literature. Should, should that be the fact that technology is changing in such a way that all the time you have to develop new methodologies and new learning strategies to, to accommodate for these technologies, technological changes. It's like, a, like you're running after the change. Okay? Yeah, I totally agree with you on that one, Yoram. Uh, they, uh, you know, we never ever Stay, seem to stay with a technology long enough to really learn what are the affordances of that technology to support learning. We're on to something new. Uh, and, and it, you know, the salesmanship that's involved so often in promoting these technologies. You know, the Secretary of Education uh, in the United States recently appeared on the stage with people at Apple saying that within uh, 10 years they want every student to have uh, e-books rather than textbook, paper textbooks. Well, gosh, the Apple people love that, right? Or any tablet maker for that ma matter. But what are the affordances of an e-book versus a real book? I think there might, could be some advantages, but <coughs> teachers will, uh, and instructional designers and researchers have to work together in order to figure that out and really make the best use of it. But you're right, we're just, we keep rushing ahead. Uh, the foremost journal of reviews in education is the Review of Educational Research, published by AERA, the American <coughs> Educational Research Association. And they publish study after study that shows no significant difference for educational technology. Great example, this was a study done by some folks in Canada, Bernard uh, uh, at uh, uh, McGill, no, not at uh, Concordia. Um, in Montreal, how does distance education compare to classroom instruction? They basically found no significant differences. A very small mean effect size for interactive distance ed over traditional classroom instruction on achievement, a small negative effect for retention. More people drop out of the distance than classroom. Uh, but look at the, uh, the this is uh, 325 studies, and you can see about half of them favored classroom, about half of them favored the distance ed, and it washes out. The overall effect size is 0 0.01. It doesn't even begin to get close to the 0.4 that Hattie and others argue is meaningful. Yes, it's statistically significant, but that doesn't mean anything in the social significance or educational significance. Talent Runnels uh, and her colleagues did another study Another review, teaching courses online, a review of the research, and they looked at hundreds of studies. At the end of the day, overwhelming evidence has shown that learning in an online environment can be as effective as that in a traditional classroom. Again, if you're really not changing the pedagogy, why would there be any difference? I do most of my work these days in public health and medicine, 
And I used to be on the faculty at the Medical University of South Carolina and have continued my work in that area, now mainly with the World Health Organization. And uh, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, published an article a few years ago, Internet-Based Learning in the Health Professions, another meta-analysis. <clears throat> and again, they found no significant difference. But it's just as good, good enough. I don't think so. I, don't, I think if we're going to be involved in learning technologies, you know, there's two really, two rationales for using technology. One is to increase access for those people who wouldn't otherwise have it. And that's something I think the Open University of Israel and many open universities do. They really open up access to people who wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity for post-secondary education. And I think we do a pretty good job in that. But the second rationale is to really enhance outcomes, enhance the outcomes of teaching and learning. And there, I don't think we're reaching our full potential. Part of the problem is that we as educational researchers, we get confused between research goals and research methods. You see people walking around saying, I'm a qualitative researcher, or I'm a quantitative researcher. What does that mean? I'm a hammer carpenter, I only use hammers. I'm a saw carpenter, I only use saws. Doesn't make sense. Methods are tools. What's our goal? You know, here's six goals we could have. Theoretical goals, predictive goals, interpretivist goals, postmodern goals, design development goals, which is the sphere of educational design research, action evaluation goals. All of these are legitimate goals, but we have to be clear about what our goal is for our research agenda before we pick methods. Uh, within the theoretical goals, a good example is the work that Robert Gagné, who was a scholar at Florida State University, did to try to come up with theory of the conditions of learning. He was a cognitive, he was originally a behavioral psychologist, moved into the cognitive psychology area. And uh, people with theoretical goals focus on explaining phenomena through logical analysis and synthesis of principles and results from other studies. Not too many of us do this level of work, but it's important. If you have predictive goals, you're focused on determining how education works by testing hypotheses related to theories of learning, teaching, performance. Uh, Simon Hooper and his colleagues, he's at uh, Penn State, have done a whole lot of experimental, uh, excuse me, predictive goal studies looking at cooperative learning and learner control. Interpretive is gold. My wife teaches qualitative research methods at the University of Georgia. Um, and uh, these folks, interpreters, usually use qualitative methods. Uh, but there the focus is on determining how education works by describing it and interpreting it related to learning, teaching, and performance. Delia Newman at the University of Maryland <clears throat> has done some good studies on observations of children using commercial software. Postmodern goals, this is not done too much in uh, educational technology, more in other areas like curriculum. But here the focus is on examining the assumptions underlying educational programs with the goal of revealing hidden agendas and empowering disenfranchised minorities. So when the Secretary of Education in the United States says everybody's going to have an e-textbook, what's that going to mean for the inner city kid who if he, he or she walks down the street carrying an iPad is going to get mugged and have the iPad stolen? Uh, Ann Devaney, who used to be at the University of Wisconsin, now she's at uh, University of California, uh, Irvine. Uh, she's done analyses of inst instructional technology in relationship to race and gender and power and so forth. Now design development goals, here you're focused on two objectives, two primary objectives. Developing a creative solution to a real world problem and at the same time 
identifying reusable design principles, reusable theoretical knowledge, if you will. So it's, it has a dual purpose, solving the problem and discovering generalizable knowledge. <clears throat> Sasha Barab, who used to be at Indiana, now is at Arizona State, has been working for years on a research agenda focused on what he calls learning engagement theory, mainly in the area of science education, and has built these learning environments like Quest Atlantis and so forth. He's a, he uses design-based research. Or you can have action evaluation goals. Here, the focus is on describing, improving, or estimating the effectiveness and worth of a particular program. Uh, a study I did a few years ago uh, with Jeanette Hill was an, an evaluation, a four-year evaluation of, of a laptop program at a K through 12 school. So once you've got your goal in mind, then you can say, okay, what's the best method? What's the best tool? Is it quantitative, qualitative, experimental, critical theory, historical, literature review, mixed methods? Most often in design-based research or educational design research, it's mixed methods. But in education, and in fact in all the social sciences, there's a bias toward experimental. That's the gold standard. People literally say that's the gold standard. Robert Slavin is one of the major proponents of this, and he wrote a number of books. One of them is called Educational Research in an Age of Accountability. And he said there's only five questions you should ask about an educational research study. Is there a control group? Are the control and experimental groups assigned randomly? If a matched study, are the groups extremely similar? Is the sample size large enough? Are the results statistically significant? And this bias toward the experimental you see in literature because many of the journal editors expect this and only look for this. A great example of someone who does lots of this is Richard Mayer from the University of California, um, Bard? UCLA. Yes, yeah. Uh, and Richard's a good guy, he's a friend of mine, but he does lots of experimental studies. And there's advantages, they're quick, they're controlled. Most, most of his studies, the treatment is 30 minutes or less. They yield publishable findings rapidly. They can be done alone or with just one student. You treat your participants as subjects. It's easy. Now, I'm not saying everything he does is easy, but it's relatively easy. And it pays off. This is his uh, Google Scholar page. He's published 538 articles and books. How many of you are close to that? Not me. Uh, he's been cited in the literature almost 50,000 times. Uh, one of his books, Multimedia Learning, is cited 4,284 times. Now, by contrast, look at Sasha Barab, who does design-based research. It's long-term. It's messy. It's much more difficult to publish. Just two days ago, I got a woeful letter from one of my graduate students who said, uh, who had submitted an article about the phase one of a design-based study that really was the uh, initial definition of the design principles. Beautiful article. Both, all three of the reviewers said, uh, this is a great article, but we want to wait, we don't want to publish it until you have real results. <laughs> well, here's the catch-22. By the time you get real results with design-based research, your study is 100 pages long. No one will publish it. So it's difficult to get published. It requires a team. You treat your participants as collaborators. It's hard. But it can be done. This is uh, Sasha's Google page. It's 200 articles and books. And uh, <clears throat> about 9,000 citations. Now, he hasn't been in the field as long as Richard, but. Now, Mayers boiled down his uh, research into what he calls multimedia learning principles. He's got about 12 of these. I just put some of them here. And, the, and they're, they're good principles. Uh, 
you know, the coherence principle, for example, people learn better when extraneous words, pictures, and sounds are excluded rather than included. People, redundancy pr principle, people learn better from graphics and narration than from graphics, narration, and on-screen text. So he's got uh, these 12 principles. How many of you are applying these principles? How many of you, when you go to design something that involves multimedia, say, oh, I better go consult Mayer? Probably not too many. You know, everyone's all excited about MOOCs these days. Uh, MIT uh, said that uh, the MOOC uh, <clears throat> is the most important technology, educational technology in 200 years. Well, I've taught a couple of MOOCs, and I've been a student in about a dozen MOOCs, and I've yet to see a MOOC that applied Mayer's principles. This is a typical screen from one of the MOOCs I took. This was a MOOC on how to teach online. If I had gone out of my way to design a course to teach you how not to teach online, this would have been it. I mean, it was really quite bad. And basically, the design was you had uh, very dense screens and then a, a picture of this woman speaking to you. And uh, it just, this, this is actually, this whole thing is an actual screen. And I mean, it was like Snoozeville. <laughs> uh, this was a course that had really high production value. Uh, Kurt Squire is a friend of mine. He's at Wisconsin. He taught a course on video games and learning. They had these uh, very high production value videos in them. This features James G talking about the effects of games. But for some reason, while he's talking, there's this complicated animation going on over here. They're not connected. They're not in, in, aligned at all. And it was really distracting. I had to watch the video several times to figure out what he was saying. Mayor would have been rolling over. About this. No, I think Mayer will also agree that this does not fit because it distracts attention. Exactly. Exactly. The point is, no one is applying this research. That, Maybe you know. he wants it to go down. <laughs> That's true. That's true. This, was a, this is probably the best MOOC I've ever been in. It was a MOOC on comic books and graphic novels taught by a classics professor from the University of Colorado. Um, but this is, a tip, this is a screen from uh, one of uh, the videos. And so his voice is over this. But the text, I mean, he literally read every one of these bullets. Now, it was a good course because of the tasks that were involved. I had to write a comic book. That was the major task in the course, to write a comic book. But um, it, uh, as far as multimedia design principles, they're not applied at all. And yet Coursera has $50 million to produce these courses. $50 million. So I think we need a new approach. We need to do design-based research. To, uh, say something about those yeah. principles. You have to, people tend to, to leave the question mark off and to make it exclama exclamation mark. They are, I think some principles should have been called guidelines, maybe. And sometimes in cases where you, where you are not sure, we need guidelines in cases where we are not sure. Mm -hmm. And usually we can work intuitively, let's say in 50% or maybe even 90% of the cases. Yeah. But, but for those that we are not sure about, here the, these principles might be helpful to help us, you know. But we cannot say this is said It's like kind of do it as it is. It's yeah, yeah, the yeah. They are guidelines, but I guess what I'm because trying to argue is that, gosh, all this research being done to develop these twelve guidelines, and then they're not used. Now we can see that in other areas too. Public health, for example, it's lots of information about how we ought to eat and how we ought to exercise and so forth. I'm a good, great example of not following that advice. So, um, so we need more impact. And that impact needs to be on real world problems. 
And I would argue that all of our educational research should be focused more on impact than just getting published or presenting whatever. So a uh, couple, uh, last year actually, well, no, what's 2014, in 2012, uh, published this book with Susan McKinney from the University of Twente and the Open University of the Netherlands. He's 80% at the Open University of the Netherlands and 20% at the University of Twente. <clears throat> called Conducting Educational Design Research. Now, I've uh, known Susan for a long time. I worked with her when she was a graduate student. She's actually an American, but she and her husband moved to the Netherlands uh, over 20 years ago, and he's now a Dutch uh, a physician who has a, a Dutch language practice there. And uh, anyway, uh, we kind of tried to write this as the missing manual on how to do educational design research. Because there were a lot of books out there about design-based research, but not one that really showed you how to do it. Uh, <clears throat> when you do educational design research, you need to work on a real-world problem. You work closely with practitioners to define an important pedagogical outcome and create a prototype learning environment informed by the best theory, and then test that prototype over and over again until you reach that pedagogical goal or reach a point of diminishing returns. Generally, you'll find that you will be should emphasize content and pedagogy rather than just technology. Technology is a vehicle, an important vehicle for content and pedagogy. But the things that really impact learning are content and pedagogy and how we interact with that. Give special attention to supporting those interactions and test refine and retest the learning environment until the outcome is reached. And at the same time, you refine theory, you refine your design principles. I know that's a lot of verbiage, but I'm going to show you some case studies of this. This is our little model. Uh, we actually are making adjustments in it all the time. But you basically, you go through phases. Uh, the analysis and exploration phase, you're really working closely with the practitioners to, who own the problem to really understand the nature of the problem. You don't walk in and say, oh, we're going to give everybody iPads, let's see if learning improves. No. What are the problems that your students are having? What's the best pedagogical design to overcome those problems? And what technology might, if you need a technology, how might technology support those pedagogical dimensions? So you do an analysis and exploration phase. Then you get into the design and construction phase where you're uh, coming up with your prototype. And then you go, what this graph doesn't do very well is show the iterative nature of the testing and refinement. <coughs> but the overall goal is to come to a mature intervention, a mature uh, solution to the problem, and enhance theoretical understanding. And you also try to pay attention to how you implement this on a wider scale. How will this be exported to others? So I'm going to give you some examples of research that my graduate students have done on using educational design research. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Dr. Eun Jung Oh. She came to me from uh, Korea, and she's now assistant professor at the University of Illinois. And Dr. Ying Lu from China, now working at the University of Wisconsin. Um, the first case study, though, is one of students, uh, Susan's students, Harini Raval. Uh, she did her PhD at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And uh, <clears throat> Harini works with the poorest of the poor children in India. These are children who literally start working almost as soon as they can carry something. And uh, they don't go to regular school. And so they form these. Uh, sort of, uh, they call them pop-up schools, schools that just, they pop them up somewhere and try to grab as many kids as they can and teach them basic literacy and numeracy and so forth. Uh, and uh, they don't have regular teachers, they have para-teachers. These are people that at best have an eighth grade education, but they're capable of teaching the basic. So her dissertation was called Supporting Para-Teachers in an Indian Non-Government Organization, NGO, the Plan and Act Reflect Cycle. Uh, 
It was an educational design research study led by herself and, and Susan. The main research question was what kind of uh, professional support can help these parateachers adopt teaching strategies with a learner-centered learner orientation. Primarily these uh, people were teaching very didactically, standing at a board, you know, blah, 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 you know, and having students recite back to them wasn't uh, very centered on what the students already knew and, and uh, what their needs were, et cetera. Uh, the dual outcomes she was f focused on were having a robust parateacher professional development program and design heuristics for creating similar programs in other contexts. Uh, she started off, uh, and uh, here's our little model again up here. So during the analysis and uh, exploration phase, she did a literature review, a field portrait, uh, lots of observations, uh, interviews with teachers, interviews with managers of programs. And uh, during the exploration, uh, you know, really uh, did a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to try to figure out how could you do professional development with these para-teachers. Yeah, of course, Harini had a long-term interest in developing countries, so did Susan. Susan actually did her dissertation in South Africa, uh, <clears throat> where I'll be going next week, or this week. I go Wednesday. Um, so then the, during the design and construction phase, uh, they built this prototype professional development program. It was a, on a conceptual model of lesson planning, lesson enactment, and reflection on the lessons. Sounds really simple, but in this context, it was a revolutionary. The very idea that you would plan a lesson out, that you would enact it, and then reflect on it and modify it, that was the nature of the innovation. And develop the workshop components. She did three rounds over a uh, a two-year period where initially she ran these workshops by herself, then she had local managers run the workshops while she observed, and then in the third iteration just the local managers ran the workshops. Overall goal again of enhancing this professional development program and identifying reusable design heuristics. Uh, <clears throat> in the first implementation really worked out organizational issues, then uh, in the second uh, basic teaching and classroom management skills, and the third, learner-centeredness, uh, and had an eye toward scale, scaling this thing up. And right now, she's involved in a project that will implement this uh, professional development for 70,000 paraties, 70,000. Talk about impact. Her di uh, like all of my students who've done design-based research, rather than writing a dissertation that's 300 pages of stuff, it's all done in the form of research articles, either already published or ready to go out the door, journal-ready publications. And so you can see here some of the journals in which she published. I actually went in, uh, in uh, November and December, I went and worked with Harini in uh, Pune, in uh, India, and here I am visiting one of the little they have these one-room schools that they support in rural areas and in inner cities and so forth. And it, was, it was an amazing experience. So that's one case study. Another case study, this one was done by my former doctoral student, David Picaro, who's uh, just becoming a faculty member at Utah State. Uh, he did his dissertation in Oman. His uh, study was called Omani Undergraduate Student Reactions to Collaborative Knowledge Building. In Oman, it was a teacher education program. Here you see him uh, teaching a class. He was trying to introduce constructivist pedagogy into Omani teacher education. Omani teacher education, like most of K-12 education there, was very didactic, very traditional, very teacher-centered. So his research goals were to establish the viability of constructivist pedagogy using a particular computer tool called CSCL, Computer Supported 
Collaborative Learning at Sultan Qaboos University. I always mess that up. Um, and he wanted to present a refined model and design principles for implementing CSCL and learning in a Islamic educational culture. Some of the research questions, what uh, changes occur in teachers and students when they get involved in something like this? Uh, how do they manage these changes? And what are the characteristics of a sustainable constructivist learning environment in a culture that is primarily the teacher is the ultimate rule in the classroom? So you're really trying to break with some major traditions. Um, so he worked within the context of an educational technology course for pre-service teachers, uh, used a particular pedagogy that was originally developed in the States called Fostering a Community of Learners, and used a, a tool called FLEE4, uh, which was based on knowledge form. Some of you might be familiar with knowledge form. Uh, in this particular pedagogy, students actually design, learn about multimedia by designing multimedia. So he put the students into teams, and one would be a project manager, one would be an instructional designer, one would be a graphic artist, audiovisual specialist, and web specialist. And they were supposed to create a learning resource that would solve an educational problem in a particular context. And they work collaboratively collaboratively to build these multimedia programs. Uh, this is the timeline for his study. He started uh, doing the theoretical background in September 2008 and uh, finished and defended his study in May 2011. For the last three years, he's been working for an international uh, non-government organization traveling around the world doing similar work like this. Uh, data collection involved lots of different things, questionnaires, interviews, uh, course debriefs, online data, analyzing the assignments, uh, then got into focus groups. Of course, students are separated by gender there, so uh, he had to have a collaborative researcher, a woman, work with him to interview the females, uh, and uh, other types of data were collected. And during the last phase, uh, the first two phases, he taught the course. So he taught it for two consecutive semesters. In the last iteration, he had the course taught by an Omani instructor. And that's very important. You can't come in as the researcher and just continue to implement these innovations. You need to build them in such a way that the local people who own the problem can implement them. Lots of different data analysis was used, a lot of mixed methods used a program called Atlas TI to keep uh, track of all that, qualitative uh, analysis program. Findings, uh, he found, of course, that be, you know, this was a difficult sell, this idea of constructivism, because there's such a cultural emphasis on oral learning, the teacher as the authority, gender separation, technology acceptance, collaboration, and so forth. Um, and had to you know, build legitimacy for this particular innovation. Um, and uh, generally found that the students liked it. And they particularly liked it when they could do the assignments online and, they, and men could work with women online. They couldn't work together in the classroom, but they could work together online. Um, <clears throat> there were some issues with uh, assessment. Uh, the university there used very traditional assessments, so how was this going to mesh with that? And some technical limitations and so forth. Uh, this was his framework. Uh, don't have time to go into that, but in any time you do a design-based study, you build a, f uh, a framework that shows all the variables and how they relate. And he published a number of articles about this, including in Educause Review, one of the things I always have my students do is publish some articles on their own, but always publish at least one with the practitioners, with the subject matter specialist. In this case, uh, this fellow was uh, 
a professor of pedagogy there at uh, the Omani University, and they published an article in Educause Review about this work. The last case study was uh, one that I worked on with Eun Jung Oh from Korea, and uh, she was focused on how do you get students to really work together, adult students work together to do effective group work in an e-learning course. Um, <clears throat> so her research goals were both practical and theoretical, to optimize collaborative group work in an online learning environment and to present a refined model and design principles for online collaborative work. This was uh, her time. Uh, she started her uh, initial analysis in summer of 2007, did her three iterations, and it's, you're not limited to three, but for most dissertations, it's three. Uh, she's continuing this research now at the University of Illinois and uh, went through the major phases, again, of exploration, enactment, implementation, and dissemination. Now she uh, used, rather than the model that is in our new book, she used the model that I wrote about in this book back in 2006. So this is the model that she used. It's, it's a little simplistic, but it's funny how many people are using this model uh, for their studies. But basically, again, you do this initial analysis of the real world problem, working closely with practitioners, develop a prototype solution based on the best possible theory and the best possible technological innovations, do iterative cycles of testing and refinement, and then reflect to build your design principles and enhance the solution. So in the first phase, uh, I was actually the practitioner in this study. I wanted to move, I had taught an evaluation course for 18 years face to face, and I, I had a lot of requests to move the course online. But the pedagogy that I used in the face to face course was authentic task. I would go out and recruit clients, faculty on campus or people in businesses in Atlanta, and who needed something evaluated and the primary pedagogy in the course was that students had to plan, conduct, and report an evaluation of a real educational product in a real context. So they learned evaluation by doing evaluation. And I wanted to be able to do that online. So we worked together through the analysis phase. The eventual course was a Moodle-based uh, course. And I taught the course uh, three times for her dissertation, three consecutive semesters. And I had students in the course from the US, Canada, Europe, Australia, Africa, just literally all over the world sign up for this course. And what I would do, because the University of Georgia is not really big into distance ed, we didn't have a mechanism for enrolling students. So I would contact, or have the student contact their local instructor and they would sign up for an independent study with that person, do my course, and get credit that way at their home institution. Um, so we implemented the course for three semesters. Again, each iteration, I had to recruit real-world clients for them to work with. Mostly they were people in e-learning companies that had a product that was either in a, a beta stage or needed some sort of formative evaluation and they would plan, conduct, and report the evaluation over the 15-week semester. Data was collected, intensive ob observations, surveys, interviews, document analysis, and so forth. And in the end, uh, she was able to come up with a set of principles and models on how to enhance group work and how to support self-regulated learning. Uh, the, the course was based on a book I wrote back in 2000. Three with an Australian John Hedberg on evaluation. Um, we, uh, we actually rewrote the book as an e-text for the online course. Um, and again, research questions, you know, what challenges do learners encounter when they work in groups? What are the attributes of groups that work well and groups that don't work well? What supports or scaffolds do learners need during group work? When I taught this course for all those years face-to-face, -face, I would have multiple groups in a class, 
And I would have one group that would work so well together. I literally had two marriages come out of my class. Two marriages. They would really work well together. And then I'd have the most of the groups were kind of in the middle. They'd work well, but they didn't become lifelong friends or anything. They were productive. And then I would have the group from hell. You know, the group that fought tooth and nail, literally sometimes had to take people out of groups and put them in other groups. I don't know what it is about human nature, but it always seemed to be that pattern. We found that in the online course too. This was her conceptual framework. Uh, you know, again, the goal is a successful completion of the task, which is planning, conducting, and reporting and evaluation, but also learning a lot about evaluation. And these are the negative indicators for effective group work, the positive indicators, and then other factors that influence that. Um, and as we went through the iterations, the challenges we found, she found, and that we resolved, became fewer and fewer. <coughs> For example, and probably I should have realized this earlier, even before we started the course, this was a simple thing, but we found that students who were, if we had a team where one student was in the Netherlands, another student was in Australia, another one was in America, they couldn't work well together, simply because of time zone. <coughs> so one of the little design principles we came up with was that we never had students in a group that were not within three time zones of each other. And that reduced a lot of problems. But, um, and we also uh, really learned a lot about the importance of the leader of the group and how to pick that person and so forth. So as we went through each iteration of the course, the problems, the difficulties we had got fewer and fewer. Um, so the comparisons are between the iterations? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we would iterate, we'd run the course one time, and we'd find out what worked well, what didn't, and then enhance the course, change certain things, like simple things like the group, how we organize the groups, more complicated things like providing additional scaffolding for the leader, uh, tools and things that would keep them on task. One of the things we did, for example, is we developed something called uh, Fridays at 5. And at 5 o'clock on Friday, which in the States is the end of the work week, um, not everywhere in the world, obviously, but we would send out an email to the team leaders and say, what has your team accomplished in the last week? What's lagging behind? What help do you need? going into next week. Just, it was like five or six little questions trying to just scaffold their management, their leadership of their team. And those types of things helped. But, yeah. But, so why I'm just, I know, field, field research is different. Mm -hmm. But from one iteration to the other iteration, you, you changed a couple of things. Yeah. So you, you never know whether third iteration, which was marvelous uh, in the sense of outcomes of learning and so forth, uh, is a product of what? Well, yes, exactly. What you're trying to then do is you've identified a set of design principles that enable you to both improve your course, but then could also be used to design other courses. So the real product is not, well, the product is the solution but it's also these reusable design principles. So you're, you're getting two types of outcomes. Actually, you're getting three if you're doing it right. You get the enhanced solution, the robust design principles, and you get professional development for everyone involved in the process. Um, so maybe it'll come a little clearer if I show. So for example, these were some of the negative and positive indicators of group work. Uh, and they're not, you know, earth-shaking uh, type, type things. But for example, in the groups that didn't work well, there were occasionally one or two free riders or social loafers, people who just didn't do their work, you know. And so how do you uh, 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 help the leader get these people on board? Sometimes you actually have to intervene and 
maybe take someone out of a group and, and uh, so forth. Um, but then in the effective groups, you saw effective leadership, uh, sense of mutual contribution, fair and balanced workload, and so forth. Um, and also, in each iteration, we can't, these are some of the changes we made uh, to improve. And we had to make fewer changes as we went, as the course got better and better and better. So in the end, Unjung was able to identify seven design principles and 30 associated strategies. I've just got uh, a few of them here. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, you know, this was uh, reusable knowledge that could be applied in other online courses. For example, here's some of the design principles. Again, they sound intuitive, but they're, each one of these is supported by a set of strategies. So facilitating communication, establishing a sense of community, uh, providing a variety of technology everyone can use, et cetera, et cetera. That was her on her defense day. This was a, a, another student who actually did a parallel dissertation within the same course. This is Ying Lu, and uh, there's her committee. There's Jeanette Hill, Mike Hannafin, uh, Larley Sandman, and myself. She's University of Wisconsin. All of my EDR, Educational Design Research Studies, have used research article formats for their dissertation. Typically what I do is I have them begin by presenting papers at conferences like Ed Media or eLearn, AECT, uh, during the first two phases and then eventually a series of refereed journal articles. Now, we've set up a website that has a lot of resources about this. These are other books about, uh, you know, the Handbook of Design Research Methods, uh, this was the 2006 book that I had a chapter in. Uh, my colleague Dave Ranking uh, wrote a book on formative and design experiments, mainly within the uh, reading and literacy area. Uh, but we have this website where you can go. And uh, we've got lots of different resources here. So for example, uh, and I'll make sure everyone gets a PDF of all these slides, and you can have the slides too. But here you can see interviews with various people about how they do design research, like Sasha and Brenda Bannon at George Mason University, and Paul Cobb at Vanderbilt, Alan Collins, who was one of the creators of the methodology. I had my doctoral students go to various conferences and record interviews uh, with these folks to make this uh, database. Um, And, um, and we've got, uh, oh, this is, a, yeah, this is a student in Portugal, actually, who has put together a, a page just rep showing all the different ways people represent design research. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's, there's lots of different ways of representing this process. So there's other things here, too. Uh, free papers and, and books and things you can download. So. Um. so, how many of you are ready to sign up <coughs> to go do educational design research? Good. I've saved one person. <laughs> Uh, Yoram knows I studied to be a Catholic priest for four years. I was going to be a missionary and go save the natives in, Am in the Amazon basin. No, but you can tell, tell me what you told me. The year, in the critical year, they yeah. just told you that they yeah. see you cannot be a priest. Yeah, that's right. I got kicked out of the seminary uh, because after four years of kind of being a, a bad boy in the seminary, it's a long story, but... Basically, the next year was going to be a year of total silence and prayer. And the priest came to me and said, uh, Tom, we don't think you can do this. <laughs> and they were right. <laughs> My son is happy about it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, 
Why should you do design-based research? Well, education is a design profession. It's like architecture and engineering. <clears throat> and so we should pursue design research that integrates the desire to solve real-world problems with the search for knowledge. The Design-Based research, coll research Collective, which is a group of, of younger folks doing this, say that the value of design-based research should be measured by its ability to improve educational practice. And indeed, I would say all educational research should be measured by its capability to improve practice. <coughs> this is not physics. This isn't hard, basic science. Yeah, we can do all kinds of thought experiments and, you know, do experiments in physics and chemistry and so forth, hoping to discover something, but that's never going to happen in education. We need to do applied research. So don't waste your life. Do design research. Charles de Forges, I think, uh, put it pretty well. <clears throat> He's a professor in the UK. He said the status of research deemed educational would have to be judged first in terms of its discipline quality and secondly, in terms of its impact. Educational design research has quality, it's rigorous, and it has impact. Poor discipline is no discipline, and excellent research without impact is not educational. Now quality, it's one of my favorite words, and this is one of my favorite books. I used to use this as a textbook. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. How many of you read this book? All right, lots of hands. Uh, it's a book about quality. It's an inquiry into values. And Piercing wrote that, <clears throat> excuse me, quality is a characteristic of thought and statement that's recognized by a non-thinking process. Definitions are a product of rigid formal thinking, so quality cannot be defined. We know when we see quality. We know it when we see it. But we, it's really difficult to define. But I think if we don't see research that has impact, we're not seeing quality. But co quality is controversial. We see that in the Olympics. or the, the, How many of you are watching the Winter Games? I assume they got started, right? I understand the uh, hotels there are going to be ready by uh, 2018. So... Um. <laughs> <clears throat> they put in the security cameras first, <laughs> and uh, they haven't finished the toilets, apparently. Anyway, uh, remember back in the Olympic Games in Athens, Greece, where uh, they gave the gold medal to an American, Paul Ham, but everyone agreed that Yang Tae-yong from South Korea should have gotten the gold, because the quality of his performance was higher. Judging is quality is difficult. There was a really big scandal in the Salt Lake Winter Games in judging quality. Does anybody remember what that was about? 2002? It was the ice skating. Remember that? So they gave the Russians the gold medal. This guy, he can't believe it. They gave us the gold medal. You know? Look at these poor Canadians. So look at her. She says, you know, eventually they went back and they found that a French judge had been bribed, so they gave the gold medal to the Canadians. You remember all this? It's a pretty big judging scandal. Why is it always the French? No. <laughs> um, but that was a pretty big judging scandal. But in that same month, February 2002, there was an even bigger scandal. And do you know about the Westminster Dog Show? The Westminster Dog Show is the biggest show in America judging the quality of dogs. And in February 2002, this dog won best in show. Have you ever seen an uglier dog? <laughs> and by the way, it's a French poodle. You see a pattern here? You know, last year, this dog won best in show. Is that an ugly dog or what? It looks like a bug. It looks like an insect. Quality is difficult to judge. Imagine instead of my dog, Zipper had been there. Don't you think Zipper would have won? That's high quality. That's, quali that's a quality dog. Thank you very much.